Um, I want to thank you all for joining me. And for those of you who are watching, I'm Bonita Woods. And I am here with an amazing group of spiritual leaders and healers and practitioners. Uh, We're discussing how it is for people of color when white people respond to the Black Lives Movement across the board and how we can all come together to, I see it as growing the Black Lives Movement to full global unity and empowerment but we're starting here. Um, would anyone like to start with either, if you know, your, how it is for you when people are supportive of this or dismissive or any thoughts about this concept? Okay, well, I'm going to give a start here. All of this started for me because when I said Black Lives Matter, I got a huge response from people, like everything from uh, people saying, oh, Benita, you must be Ursi Potter's daughter for sure, to uh, people threatening our lives and telling me I'm a heretic. Um, and I'm seeing more and more people are actually now going from their initial response. A lot of people are thinking, a lot of people are really putting things together instead of being reactive, more and more people wish to be active. Uh, I'm getting a lot of people contacting me saying they want to evolve, they want to reach out, but they don't want to offend people with their questions. They're not sure what to do. Um, Daryl, uh, would you care to start this off? Okay, so you were doing your mind reading thing because I was, <laughs> so I do want to contextualize it I, for the people who are watching because in listening, one of the key things I, I think you've left out just subconsciously was specifically white people because I know that when you talked to us, it was geared towards, you know, centered in, in what is it when air quote white people, you know, when they reach out for support or maybe dismiss the understanding of the importance of why Black Lives Matters in, in, in the march. Um, and, I, and again, I'm going to try to abide by the conciseness rule because, you know, I can talk when I get rolling. Um, <laughs> so in that particular light, I think, one, it, it, it smacks regard, uh, directly against the whole white fragility piece that we talked about, or the not understanding that race is a social construct and what that means. So when people, when white people dismiss the understanding that this phenomenon has been around since people were enslaved, whether it was Eastern Europeans being enslaved by Western Europeans and this idea of Africans being, um, and that blackness being linked with slavery, it's like this denial of understanding that these hierarchies were man-made by who we collectively now think of the oppressor and which is then connected with racism, which is white supremacy, which is the whole institution and structure of oppression that is worldwide, it's global. And so when people don't think about, when white people specifically, but even people who are not considered white, when they decide to deflect and make this superficial by expanding it to say all lives matter, blue lives matter, what you're doing is, saying, is showing your ignorance, number one, that you don't understand the oppressive nature that has been simplified into white superiority. So you're not understanding the oppressive nature. Um, so for me, it is really when it's dismissed, Black Lives Matter movement is dismissed, it means that folks who are identified with whatever whiteness is for them are really fragile in their understanding of humanity and what it means to be an equal person just by virtue of being alive. And so it dismisses the, everything about why this matters from time immemorial, you know, and the subjugation of people in general. So I could go on and on, but I'm going to stop. <laughs> no, that, that is a brilliant 
start. Thank you. And um, Tiffany, if I could ask you, of course, I mean, you are, you talk with people about their feelings and how they can grow and evolve for your work. So I, I know you have some insight to this. Um, well, yeah, um, as, a, as a therapist, I'm doing therapist. Uh, um, I work in an organization uh, where um, everyone within the organization is having that, that conversation. Um, and I have experienced, you know, three different situations. Um, one, uh, as an organization, they uh, had a platform to speak out about the things that were happening in the media to uh, people who are Black in America. And in that forum, the CEO, the CFO, um, you know, someone made an anonymous comment, um, uh, you know, saying that the, the, the chief medical officer, who is a, a Black man, um, makes more money than anyone, as if he didn't have a, a cause to speak out about racism. And then also the person who is this, the, the executive director, um, you know, didn't have like a cause to speak out, out against it as well. And so they had to justify why they were speaking out against it as, as we work at a human service organization that provides medical as well as mental health services and dental services, um, you know, and so this has like caused, you know, a little bit of heat, you know, you know, where there's a little bit of discomfort for a lot of people uh, to be confronted with the reality that this exists, this problem that we see, you know, globally exists within the organization. Um, and, and then also, um, I'm also connected to schools. And as a person who helps the, the people there that I serve to really uh, have balanced lives, you know, in a system that really has a problem because it, uh, it serves, you know, this population, my population, the people of color, black people um, specifically. And there are some disparities or some things that happen that are, you know, that show the, the systemic problem with racism in America. So, um, you know, some things like who gets referred to therapy, you know, more young, girls are referred than boys. Boys go down the discipline pipe. They go to the deans and then they go to, you know, suspension and all of that and not getting the care and support that they need. Um, and so within the organization, we have started to have conversations about racism in our work. And I like to shout out um, Shauna Murray Brown for doing a webinar on uh, decolonizing therapy, because this is one industry where she is definitely advocating that you look at your practices, you look at um, you know, how you, your identity impacts how you see particularly black people. And um, you know, I have heard a lot of commentary from my coworkers reflecting where they are and where their level of consciousness um, is at this point in time. Um, and I have to recognize a broader perspective as a spiritual person that, you know, cosmically, this is a time of great change, a, a time of great shifting away from paradigms that have existed, you know, under different circumstances. And that, you know, it is kind of like the pulling back of the curtain so that people have to be faced with the atrocities that have been happening for centuries against Black people in America. And, um, you know, this, as, uh, as Dr. Darrell said, that this is not new, this has been happening. Mm -hmm. um, but now you are faced with it and you have to sit with the imagery and this is the right circumstances cosmically, you know, for change to happen where we are also here but we have to be at home where we're forced to see things as for what they are. We're confronted with it. Um, and so this, this, this makes you uncomfortable, right? And, that, and for me, I don't literally, outside of you, Benita, <laughs> no one white calls me on a personal basis. Um, so my coworkers are the people where I'm rubbing elbows with. And um, 
because I can speak from my heart and I can feel the energy that they're vibrating with, some, some of them really want to be sincere, really want to understand and really want to do something about it. While others are very uncomfortable, but they are meeting the subject where they are, which is on a very surface level because it's extremely you know, upsetting. And because right. I am aware of how they're feeling energetically, I have compassion for where they are without taking on um, where they are. So you're I, saying, like say white people are uncomfortable about the Black Lives Movement. So you end up comforting and supporting them with their discomfort? I don't comfort them. I just, I don't react to it. Yeah. You know, I'm not but, internalizing their response to it. Basically. Right. And I mean, how would it be for them to just say to you, I'm uncomfortable. I don't know what to say or do, but I'm here for you. Are you okay? Like, well, that has been said to me, but you know, unfortunately, you know, it's difficult when you, you have information that people don't necessarily intend to share with you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's not just the words that I receive when I'm interacting with someone, I receive their energetic experience. So oh, I yeah. have to get the discongruence of what you're saying, but what you're really experiencing energetically within your body. And so this person that asked me that was extremely uncomfortable, very nervous, and was almost as if they were reading a script from a play that they were being judged for their performance on. Mm -hmm. So that did not feel good to my soul at all. It did not feel nourishing to my spirit at all. Mm -hmm. I felt the inner, inner, discomfort that that person was experiencing and so right. i didn't i didn't respond other than say i'm fine oh but we had a, i want to share this other thing too because we had an open forum where people within an organization could come and anonymously speak about your experiences that that reveal racial issues within the organization and i shared an experience um there that talked about my experience, difficulties getting hired, although I submitted my resume and never got a response. I have more than qualified with the years of experience that I had. Um, and the way I got on with this organization was through another, like the back door, <laughs> through a federal government website for loan forgiveness. That's how I got in through the back door. The, oh. My resume went straight to the hiring director. So I, so I shared that, but also spoke to the fact that um, this is not new. In one of the hearing sessions that the director of my department had, and um, just she was just holding listening sessions for therapists to speak about what they're experiencing. And so I, I shared that, you know, my family has a personal experience of, of, of a member being murdered by a white police officer when he was on his knees with his hands behind his head. And that, you know, this is not new to me and new to us, period. Um, and just to say that, yeah, well, I'm ready for the revolution of shifting, of change, um, and I'm comfortable with your discomfort, um, but I, I don't have the option to opt out of this journey to be present because you see who I am. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? I don't have the privilege to be quiet and not to speak about it because if in order to be an anti-racist and I love the work of Ibram X. Kendi, you have to speak out about it now. This is the time to say that's not okay. Exactly. And certainly you work with the most high risk demographic, the special needs black young men. And They're the and, ones that yeah. are the most High, you know, the highest rate of murders by the police, abuse by the police, false arrest by the police. And so you, you do see this, you do represent this. And a lot of suicidality, suicidality is present on, my, uh, on all the people yeah. that I see and getting into a place of seeing value in their lives when you are in a community and all the media does not value your life or the lives of people that look like you you know, requires me to use strategies that really are effective that go straight to the heart. Um, right. You know, I am a therapist and I like to say that I'm not a traditional therapist because I use all tools and strategies that, that work. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Tiffany. Thank you. And I'd like to shift at the moment 
uh, to Will, Will Harris. Can, thank you, thank you so much, Tiffany. Um, Will, you travel all over the world and you see how people respond to you all over the world. And you are, you know, a very active businessman as well as a philanthropist. You help, you know, the impoverished and orphaned children around the world to get their voice and to have positive self-esteem and see their potential futures. So how is all of this treating you right now? Do you have, a, you know, what's going on there? Um, <clears throat> so first of all, thank you for, having this forum, it, it means a lot. Um, and uh, Tiffany, you're funny. You, you had me dying laughing, girl, when you were talking about that script. <laughs> so there's, there's three different points um, that, that I feel uh, really close to. The first point is the Black Lives Matter, the term. The second is white power. And the third is um, when we are complaining about the situation, but we're not offering solutions to the situation. And I'm gonna offer two solutions. So around the first one, Black Lives Matter. So Daryl was talking about the term. And I know that term puts a lot of people off. And if we are going to keep it real, when Black Lives Matter term first came out, a lot of people were hating on that term. I wasn't even too happy about the term because my first thought process was, well, if this type of life matters, then does that mean this one doesn't? So people were like, boom, 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 boom. Now, Black Lives Matter term is kind of cool. But if we keep it real, it won't cool when it first came out. Everybody was hating on it, especially in the spiritual community. Black lives matter? I don't see color. All lives matter. <laughs> but now people are starting to understand it wasn't about the term. It was about what was happening that caused that term to come up. Now we're starting to understand that when I say black lives matter and you say all lives matter, that's like if I say save the dolphins and you say Save the universe. <laughs> That's watering down the dolphins. The dolphins are like, ain't nobody trying to kill the universe. <laughs> so saying Black Lives Matter doesn't mean something else doesn't. It means, hey, stop killing Black people who don't deserve to die. But that's a long hashtag. <laughs> Black Lives Matter works a whole lot better. So we got to be intelligent. When it comes to that, it's not that one thing means we're pushing down another. It means, hey, can we put a spotlight on this issue that has been there for way too long? And that brings me to the second topic that I purposely chose, white power. Now, I don't mean white power, like white power. I mean white power in the sense of if you are white, and you are standing up for the Black Lives Movement, that goes a whole lot further than me, a Black man, standing up for the Black Lives mm -hmm. Matter. When it first, you know, everything blew up, I wasn't on LinkedIn and Facebook and Twitter like, oh my God, Black Lives Matter. I was hoping that my white friends would stand up and say something. I was loving when my white friends called me up and said, hey man, this is kind of crazy. Um, what are your thoughts on it? You don't need a script. You don't need to feel uncomfortable. All you need is empathy. All you need is love. All you have to do is call somebody up and say, hey, um, everything that's going on, I just want you to know that I am anti-hate and I love everyone. And I just wanted to make sure you were doing okay in how you feel. That doesn't require a script. This will require somebody bringing something up. And if you, are not a person of color. Now's the time for you to stand up, just like around women empowerment. A man standing up for women empowerment can have a larger impact because that person has nothing to gain from it. A white person standing up for black people, well, you don't have anything personally to gain for it. So people are listening a little bit more. We're used to people being selfish. 
So when someone isn't selfish, that's loving. Um, the third thing, I, I got to tell you, my wife, my son, they went to protest. I'll keep it real. <laughs> in Gaithersburg, Maryland. And I was like, do we have a problem with the police in Gaithersburg, Maryland? So like, no, we're standing up for George Floyd. I was like, but that was in Minnesota. <laughs> we have no impact on that whatsoever. But we just want them to know that we're standing with them. Okay, so when we start talking about solutions and that just saying, hey, count me in. So I think it's time for us to evolve from just complaining about it. And everyone considers it their responsibility to make one suggestion. So I'm gonna give two. My first suggestion is that when it comes to the police, I think that some of the worst instances that happen that these people aren't born monsters. But if you are a police, nobody gets a call, hey, police! I just wanna let you know I'm doing wonderful. I'm having a great day today. It's, it's, just, it's just so lovely. They see the worst things every single day that you can imagine. And over time, the best of people can become reduced down to being something they did not start out being. So we have to have a way of looking at whether or not they have PTSD. How many instances trigger, all right, we need to get someone out. Because if I had the job with everyone saying, hey, the police are horrible, nobody's volunteering to be a cop. Nobody wants that job. I don't want to be shot at. <laughs> so the second thing, so anyway, the first thing is I think they need to either have a closer look on when someone has been traumatized one time too many and needs to be retired out of that role or have a shorter term of how long someone can be a police officer. Because 20 years of seeing the worst atrocities possible, yeah, that can have an impact on you. The last thing is uh, citizens police. I'm 48. When I was 28, I was head of the Citizens Police Academy in Richmond, Virginia. That was the Myrtle capital of the world back then. And what we did was we did ride-alongs with the police. It only took me one ride-along to realize I didn't want to do another ride-along. <laughs> that things are crazy out there and you get to see things from the perspective of the police too. And we were able to give feedback and comments, comments to the police. So I think that just like how we have jury duty, and as Americans, we consider it our duty to serve on the jury. We should consider it our duty to do a ride along with the police, at least one, because then you're able to see what's going on in your community. Then you're able to talk one-on-one -on -one with the police. So I'm done with protesting. Now it's time for us to give suggestions. And I appreciate you letting me talk. Oh, my word, Will. You gave us a lot to think about. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, can, I, can I chime in? Yes, Daryl. And actually, I was going to ask also if you could speak a little bit on the defund the police concept. You and I were talking about that yesterday. And Right. Sure. And so I don't, you know, there was a lot. Thank you, Will, that I wanted to touch on some things I want to challenge and just bring um, some more context to the conversation. But to your to address your, your question and your point immediately, um, Benita. So I shared with Benita for everybody else um, that I had developed a statement for the uh, Civic Association to which I belong in, in my community. There was a second part of the statement um, that wasn't published yet. It hasn't been published yet because the uh, association wants to have more of a conversation first. The first part of the statement was directly about Black Lives Matter. The second part was an extension to this idea of demilitarizing the police, which is really um, speaking to this idea of defunding the police. What that means before people get their little panties in a bunch. Um, because I think part of the issue and part of the problem collectively is that when people engage in concepts and conversations, they shut down and they hear whatever it is through their filtering process. 
So defunding the police doesn't mean get rid of the police. Oh my God, we can't. No, that's not what it means. But there is money that is being allocated to this equipment that is really used for, for militaries, which is the, what is it, the 1033 program. Um, and so defunding the police means taking money that has been allocated for militarization and putting it towards some of the things that you addressed, Will, indirectly, some of the things that will empower the police, maybe even going to programs to help them deal with trauma, uh, working within um, communities and learning how to identify and deal with people who may be exhibit exhibiting mental health and behavioral health issues, um, working to establish better community relationships so that there's that sense of community policing which would encompass this idea of the ride-alongs, but getting to know the community. Um, so those are some of the things that hopefully with my association, we will begin to address within our community and in at large. Um, but a couple of the things directly, in terms of people of whiteness being afraid to um, really have these conversations, you know, there is this fear of them losing something in connection to their whiteness, not knowing what their fellow person of whiteness is thinking or experiencing about them, not necessarily understanding and wanting to come face to face with their level of ignorance. So even if they are anti-racist, there is this, this idea that if you are white, on some level, you are racist. That doesn't mean to the extreme, but you are absolutely benefiting with this power differential. It may not be on a social economic level, but you are benefiting. And if you are engaging in that process by not even challenging how it is oppressive to anybody who doesn't have whiteness, you are complicit to being a racist. So I do have friends who are identified as white. I've had conversations before all of this um, came to be at this time, because as again, it's been happening all the time. So the, the whole idea of people are just understanding is BS to me <laughs> because it's been in front of people's faces. It's they have not chosen to see or to embrace. But so for, for my friends who have said, you know, I didn't realize how ignorant I was about this. I thought I was much more evolved than I am. And I'm, I'm committed to learning. That's what I want to see from them. I've had friends who I've been friends with for years. We've had conversations in the last couple of years, they just realized that they didn't understand what white privilege really was because they defaulted to that social economic status because they may not have grown up with having a lot of money. Oh, I'm not privileged. Well, now they understand that they, by virtue of their whiteness, they're privileged. So they are more open to engaging in the, con in the conversation, right? And coming to that reality. I still have had some white friends who have not had a conversation and, you know, with me or maybe they have with other people, and I don't know what their rationale is, so I'm not necessarily going to make justifications for them. If they decide they want to have a conversation with me, I am more than open. But much like Tiffany, I am not necessarily going to um, take in their emotionality. Yes, I'm sensitive to it, but at the same time, if we continue to deflect and to say, oh, I understand you, and let them get away, that we're defaulting and we're falling right into their white fragility. What does that do to help with anybody, help anybody? You know, it, it really doesn't. And the idea of the police, I understand individually that all officers are not the same, but I also understand collectively that the police officer position is part of a system and it is part of the same system that has been oppressive since it was created. And I also understand that when they put those uniforms on, for some people, there's a conflict. As we finally seen where there have been officers across the nation who have actually kneeled in solidarity. So there's a conflict. And I absolutely appreciate that. And I appreciate that, that you know, in part of their job, they are supposed to serve and protect everybody. They don't necessarily do that collectively. So I challenge that. And I also challenge that widespread white supremacist narrative that is really insidiously strewn throughout the, the police force as a whole. Montgomery County has its issues. 
And if you don't recognize that, maybe you haven't experienced it. But people are, who are considered black anywhere they go are not white, still have the same reactions when you see a police siren in the back of your mirror and go, oh my God, is that, I didn't do anything, what did I do? And you are so relieved when they pass you by and actually go deal with whoever they're supposed to deal with. That is real. And that happens everywhere. And that's part of the conversation. And so for the Black Lives Matter, I was absolutely ecstatic when the term first came out because unlike what was Will's experience or some other people experiencing in the default, I understood that what they were saying was in this country and worldwide with the enslavement of African descended people and indigenous descended people, meaning not of Africa, not white, well, some white ethnics when you understand it, that the, the lowest common element has always been this pigmentation of skin and it mattering less and it mattering less. So to say Black Lives Matters automatically sets the foundation to say, yeah, everybody else matters too. But until we recognize and honor that disproportionately and on the foundation of many countries, not just America, that the brutality of darker skinned people has been problematic and it has set the platform to elevate everybody else. So you can call it what you want to call it, but that's part of the issue for me and this conversation is that the things to do is not to placate it. You have to confront it. Confront doesn't necessarily mean by in an aggressive way all the time. But if we only have mild conversations and we go, oh, well, you're not there yet. And we'll keep circling this conversation. We're not going to get anywhere at all. So it takes the bravest of people, I don't care what your walk is in life, it takes the bravest of people to be open about where they are with this. And for those who actually do, want, and I'm talking about people of whiteness, people of variations of color, your social economic status, whatever. When you are ready to openly have the conversation and say, you know, I know about this, I didn't know about that. I, my understanding comes from this, but I'm willing I'm willing to be fragile and vulnerable in myself to learn more and to really understand. That's when we're gonna make progress so that you can challenge not just the laws, but the practices of the laws. We forget that the laws have been in place for so long, they're psychologically in, entwined in us. So people behave and they practice a lot of the things that they claim that they are against. And those are the things we have to highlight to say, you know, there is a, 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 a dissonance in what you profess to be about and believe against what you are actually doing and practicing. And so that, those are the things that we need to really address. And it's going to take multiple perspectives and multiple ways to do that to come together. But we can't, we can't maintain this circular thinking of somebody else is going to handle it. And yes, I do put a lot of emphasis on people of whiteness. I absolutely agree with you there, Will. You, you, I put the emphasis on people of whiteness because y'all were the ones who created this. And even with that, varying levels, but the rest of us also play into it in a myriad of ways. I And, and I'll say, and I'll be quiet in a second, I am also a therapist. I'm an educator. I'm all of these things. And in my full-time place of employee without going into too much detail. <sighs> there are a lot of people of whiteness there who talk and have built up this good game and built up this very fragile house that dare not be crushed. But what they are practicing is absolutely racist and oppressive. So until they do something different, they're going to continue to get the same results. And it may be this informal way of inflating their ego, but they're actually perpetuating the process. Meanwhile, I work with people in my individual practice who are of whiteness, who recognize where they are with it and their small steps to say, oh, aha moment. Wow, I need to change. That is the biggest difference to me. So there is a lot that we need to challenge and a lot of work that needs to be done. And in 
depending on where you are in your level of commitment and where you are in your level of, of confronting whatever internal fears you have or external fears you, you have, when you identify those things, you'll be able to take the appropriate steps to make a positive difference or not. And that is an individual journey and collectively we can also engage in that journey. Yeah, that, that is, and I got to say, I love what you said about going the other extreme of the, the white superiority thing that when we say Black Lives Matter, we're going the other end, giving support to everything. We have the comments here, Indigenous Lives Matter. And we have here in our panel, even people who are uh, African American, uh, Native American of North Central and South America, Asian American, and show me one person in the United States who guarantees they are 100% only anything. And you know, they're not. You know, we are all of us a mixed blend. You know, so thank you. Thank you for like, bringing this extra depth to the concept of Black Lives Matter is giving us the base and everyone in between is now between the two claims of who matters. I'm not sure if I'm speaking well, but I'm certainly feeling very passionate and supportive about this like powerful statement with everything else you said that was extraordinary. Thank you, Dr. Darrell. And, um, Katrina, Katrina Foster, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, for all of you who wonder who this beautiful young woman is, brilliant, beautiful, creative, artistic, spiritual. Um, and also, you know, you have more of the young person's perspective. <laughs> so well, I mean, I'm I'm not I'm not that young. I'm 43, but <laughs> really, I always thought you were. Well, you look you always look young, and you have such a vibrant energy. That's so vibrant. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'm I'm I'm, I'm a kid of the mid 70s, so I'm I'm, I'm, I'm older than I look. But uh, I'll keep it brief because I want um, I'm wanting to hear other panelists speak as well. Um, when it comes to the spiritual perspective and touching on Will's question earlier about how we, okay, while we're protesting, why, let's also start coming together and collaborating on, you know, what resolutions or ideas can we have, um, you know, to help, you know, move us forward, you know, far enough to where we don't ever have to revisit this again. And from a spiritual perspective, there has been a lot of back and forth and, you know, when it's come to this particular situation. And my thoughts and ideas about the, this when it comes to as a nation, well, starting on, on a nation level anyway, um, when it comes to the U.S. and being able to, you know, talk about this and, and stop and, and stopping and, and coming together to at least have discussion, it's gonna be really, really difficult to do that unless like Dr. Darrell mentioned earlier, there is some acknowledgement of why it's happening in the first place. Um, you know, and a perfect example of that is, you know, Germany. You know, Germany has totally atoned to what has happened in their past as a country when it's come to the Holocaust. And they've actually become a better country for it. You know, they've atoned, they've taken full responsibility and accountability for their actions. And for some reason, and I'm a proud, I'm, I'm a proud American, I'm a retired US uh, Air Force vet, but this country has a hard time atoning and acknowledging, even explaining the insanity of what's occurred and what's happened over, you know, over the course of you know, hundreds of years in this country, they won't even acknowledge it. And until there is atonement, until there is straight up, we admit full wholeheartedly, or at least admit that it's happened and admit it in a truly genuine way, it's responsibility that it's had on the African citizens and their descendants, which is what we are today. Until that happens, and by atonement, I mean atonement from our government, you know, because you know, I'm also in the federal government. So from a governmental perspective, our government has to be able to stop considering, you know, atoning and, 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 and apologizing as a sign of weakness, because this country has a big problem with that as well. 
And once it starts to realize that, you know, being able to do that is not a sign of weakness, it's a sign of strength. It's a sign, and it's a, and it paves the way to possible change. Until that country, until this country does that, you know, it's, it's really hard to imagine the protesting and rioting stopping because they won't even do that. Um, and I'll, I'll keep it short there, I can go on and on all day, but, but I think as far as a resolution, it's going to start with, you know, and identifying that there is a problem, that there, that, you know, part of the main foundation of how this country was built and established was off of literally the backs of African slaves, and that has continued to be a crack in the foundation of this country, and just like with any other home or any other building, when there's cracks, you know, there's going to be you know, some moving and some shifting until we're, it's able to become whole and become complete. Thank you. I mute myself. You are so right with that. You are so right. I mean, no structure can be to withstand any kind of disruption unless it's sturdy, has integrity. Yeah. Um, so, yes, and we just got a message. Atonement will allow healing and reparation of the damage done. Absolutely, absolutely. Even on a personal level, how often do we say to someone, I cannot reconnect with you until you understand what you did? You know, if you are trying to, like, heal a relationship after there has been, you know, any kind of uh, betrayal enslaving someone, murdering someone, that's definitely the biggest level of betrayal that we can get. Um, yes, Mariam, thank you. Um, I feel like I really, I don't have really any rights to speak to this subject. However, I, I do feel passionate about it. And that's what I was telling Bonita that this really is about Black Lives Matter, not anything else. So I echo that and, um, Nice to meet everybody on this on this panel here. Just to um, agree with people who have spoken. Yes, you spoke to the heart of the matter, um, Katrina. Atonement it would be nice if it would happen. However, unfortunately, um, places even places like Germany they see a resurgence of the white white supremacists and this whole virus that it is, in my belief, our government's behavior um, taking over other places and this behavior is being encouraged. However, I'm not here to complain about things. I'm just saying that a really, really systematic effort, and I don't have any other suggestions, I'm just saying a very systematic and continuous effort from the basics, the grassroots to re-educate, to change the culture in order to see things differently. Because as you said, it's so embedded. And Dr. Darrell, you said that too. It is so in, in our DNA now that people may not even consciously be aware of the fact that they are behaving in this way. They may think they're siding with the right side, but they act differently. They are not realizing what's going on. So um, perhaps something a little more basic with regards to change needs to start. Uh, and just training people to see things differently. I mean, frustrating to see that it seems like nothing has changed in this 200 plus years of history here. And it just really pains me to see that as a foreigner who's come to a land of opportunity to see that the citizens themselves are not being treated the way they should be. You know, anyway, I, I, I'll just stop now and mute myself. Oh, thank you so much for sharing. Thank you. And um, Dahlia, could I ask you, because you are one of my eternal inspirations in 
all aspects of um, caring about the well-being of humanity. You are a very spiritual leader. You're an energy healer. You are a pillar in your community. You know, you're also a mother and, you know, very devoted to your family. Um, how's all this going for you? Um, uh, it's, I'm without words, right? <laughs> so, uh, everybody has said so much. I, I hate to sort of double back. Um, so I'll, I'll keep it short and uh, share my experience. Uh, as far as being checked on, uh, the thing, yes to everybody's point, um, the thing that I found most striking was uh, for the individuals who reached out to me that, you know, don't look like me, um, wanting more of my personal approval than to say that they care about everything, you know, like, like, is, are we okay? As opposed to saying, like, I care about things that affect you. So that was, that was a little um, disheartening and much like Tiffany, um, knowing, feeling that and being like, okay, you know, yes, we're fine, but I, I do see you. Um, so there was that. Um, there, the experience for me was interesting. I, I don't want to, to take away from the movement by, by bringing too much of my own personal baggage into it. But I, I, you know, initially when everything started happening, I was a little bit like Will, um, first go round of, of BLM. I was like, well, you know, I needed to find myself in that. And then this, um, this year with everything coming out the way that it was, there was even deeper internal work because um, as I am in my experience, I acceptance from anybody has been an issue. Um, people that look like me, people that don't, there was this, um, this challenge uh, that would come for me being too dark or speaking funny or all these different things and then coming into this movement, crying, weeping for the, grieving for, for things that had happened to me and going, okay, well, but this isn't about me. There's a greater thing at work here. And then finally arriving to the place that um, BLM is not just working to change things for, um, this is not a, a white black thing. There's, this is working on internalized racism as well. And so what I was experiencing was internalized racism, internalized oppression. And what, what my appearance represented being rejected was, was deeper than just the surface. And so when I finally came to that place, I found my place in the Black Lives Matter movement. And, um, so, so with that, it's it's been a roller coaster, just like everybody else has said, and um, I think that it's it's important, just like everybody else has said, to acknowledge. You know, in the spiritual community, we talk about feel your feelings, and you know, don't dismiss anything. And and simultaneously, during this movement, we are dismissing so much because it's uncomfortable. You can't have both, and then for um, like another thing that I've seen is people cross-sectioning certain aspects of the movement. Like, yes, I'm for it, but not the riots. And, you know, like you can't, you're minimizing it just to this, this small negative piece and, and missing, missing the greater perspective and then missing out on an opportunity to change and, and to, to resolve what's going on for you internally in the same way that I did so that we can all come together and to Will's point, have um, uh, open discussions about moving forward in progress. And um, I just wanna say I'm a huge fan of Dr. Darrell. I love hearing you talk and every, all the points that you've made. Um, so I also uh, wanted to talk about in the beginnings of all this uh, with me and trauma um, it seems that, and I only saw one person, um, uh, bring awareness to this. His name is Lee Harrington. Um, 
and and he's uh identifies as white as far as i know <laughs> um and uh he was talking about the freeze response so there is this conversation about uh white individuals or or non people of color not saying anything not doing anything or turning away and I think that we are missing an opportunity to check in with people, not that it's our job to check in with them, but to maybe recognize the traumatic response of not fight or flight, but freeze. And in that frozen moment, maybe that's what some people are experiencing. And so um, back to, again, Tiffany's point of seeing the truth of, of people, their responses and, and um, what they are trying to do, I think that there should be um, space for are you frozen or are you ignoring the problem? Because um, I found myself frozen for a little bit if I'm if I'm transparent about about everything because I just didn't know where I fit in. It was more it was internalized, like I said. Uh, and then for uh, people not knowing what to say, we really, really have to come to this place of not fearing rejection. Like if rejection is on the table, it's going to be on the table. Not saying anything, avoiding what have you, it's, it's, you're going to get rejected regardless. So you may as well just, just come out with truth speak from your heart and then allow us to have the dialogue instead of thinking like, oh, I'm going to lose my friend. This is an issue. This is a greater issue of control, right? This is why people lie. This is why people act the way that they do this sort of people pleasing thing. Then you suppress yourself. And, and this all ties back to racial issues. And then the, um, the last thing that sort of came to my mind is that, um, everything that's going on is an issue of clashing identities. Um, I, was, uh, I can share some links in the comments later. There are tons of Facebook videos on everything that's happening that explain things for people who don't understand. And um, one pointed out how uh, Black individuals have a unique position in the United States where being Black is both culture and race. And um, and, and this, like I said, this clashing of identities and how people, uh, people who identify with their country as a patriot sort of have issue with anybody who identifies differently on deeper personal levels. And so there's this is back and forth um, that's happening that's causing conflict and, and not allowing for conversation. So, um, come to the truth of who you are and figuring out what your identity is and not um, trying to encase other people in your identity and saying that it's right and it's the only way of being is important as well in, in, in some of these greater conversations. So um, I think that was, I, you know, when we, when we, before we started all of this, I had all these things coming out of my mind. So I'm sure there'll be more, but I'll, I'll stop here. <laughs> uh, no, that was beautiful, Dahlia. Thank you. Thank you. You always, you know, manage to bring the highest, most loving spiritual context to any discussion. Thank you. So I just got to say, you guys, um, this conversation today has been so much more spiritual and kind and loving than I expected, even though I knew that's what it is, you guys are all absolutely amazing. You know, just beautifully amazing. Um, and yeah, yeah. can I interrupt you? Because before you close out. <clears throat> oh, I wasn't going to close out yet. <laughs> Please don't, because there's such a powerful conversation going on. And Katrina, you're not getting away. We've been trying. I see you guys have been messaging. Like, and I yes, see and, like, like, and, yeah. yeah. And Dahlia, and part of it was sparked while you were talking so mm -hmm. you for everything go ahead and bring it up bring it up and share it please yeah katrina i can wait seriously i i have it all here ready i want to give others a chance i, I would love to hear okay. why don't we okay listen sure. katrina and dr daryl you guys both of you unmute and share what was going on there i couldn't read it and pay attention to what dahlia was saying so 
please catch us all up because the few words I could see popping out were very powerful. Well, I'll keep it super short. What I was saying in my chat was, um, you know, from a spiritual perspective and from spiritual leaders and spiritual coaches, there has been a lot of animosity when it comes to this movement, when it comes to Black Lives Matter and whatever. And there's always been this uh, underlying assumption that, you know, if I'm spiritual, if I teach, if I coach, that, yeah, there's always this love and light to encourage and to help envelop in people and in their lives. But, um, but it's important to also acknowledge, we acknowledge the darkness, but we acknowledge the darkness, our own internal darkness, as opposed to darkness from, a, from, from an external standpoint. And what's important to just kind of note briefly when it comes to spirituality, when it comes to being a spiritual teacher, spiritual coach, is the very purpose, the very fundamental foundation, in my opinion, of why we do this in the first place, you know, to find our peace, find our wholeness in everything, in our environment, in our lives, um, to be able to manage our lives and survive so we can, you know, take it to the next level as far as our spiritual path. The very purpose of, you know, our senses, our our in, being empaths, being psychics, being clairvoyants, the purpose of, of having those powers and those abilities is to be able to sense imbalances in our environment. That is the very purpose of it. And when a lot of teachers become, you know, when they get into their roles or, you know, whether a teacher or a pastor, or whatever, I mean, yeah, I mean, many of them address, you know, the imbalances in life that life brings, because that's life. But when it comes to, and I've seen it, you know, another, uh, someone else here on the panelist has gotten a lot of lashback on speaking uh, directly about this issue, you know, and she's been attacked for it, but neither, you know, you're aware of that. And we forget that, look, you know, yes, it's all about love and peace, but it's also about that, but that's not life all the time. You know, it's important that we don't use our spiritual practices and our influences as a license to pass and, and not addressing racial injustices and human suffering. You know, you, you don't just use your practice, you know, they, you know, but what, what was that uh, quote from Gandhi? Um, you know, I, where, I, there's a quote, I can't remember it. Well, something about st staying still, you know, if, oh, if I am the change, like this being the change you want to see. Mm -hmm. But you know, but that quote is many times taken out of context, you know, because many people believe, when they hear that quote, they think, okay, if I am the change, that's enough. Like there's no responsibility in being able to, you know, the whole idea is to be able to find your balance, find your peace in, in, in an insane world, you know, in an insane world, and to be able to go out into that world and make a difference and make an impact while still maintaining you know that spiritual and physical connection and that's what the cross is about it's about that spiritual connection on a physical connection at the same time that's the whole purpose that's that's the semblance behind that cross is being in two places at one time to be able to stay physical stay grounded while still being able to act and maintain in a spiritual mindset and can and, I add um, to that, Chris, um, Katrina? Just I'm that, done now. Sorry. Yes. Well, no, <clears throat> that piece that you were just talking about, what I think a lot, and I'm not, I, I, I don't do religion, y'all. I'm just going to tell you, I don't. I'm really grounded more in, in the metaphysical because there's too much hypocrisy that I've seen in the religious construct. And that rel religiosity is just really man made. It's the spiritual piece we're talking about. But for those who, this is how they understand things. They have to remember that during this time, Jesus was very much an activist. Gandhi was very much an activist. All of these people that they profess to, you know, Muhammad and all, they were activists, you know? And so that meant that they also did something, that they felt these injustices within humanity and they did something with it. Now that they have been long gone in spirit, in the spirit world, we like to romanticize how we think they were. So that's one realistic aspect you know to look and you were talking about spiritual bypass which is the, the the language and the wording that I wanted to throw out there for everybody else which is what we were all talking about um but I also wanted to address um something uh that Dahlia spoke to in terms of her journey which was linked with kind of Will's journey and the idea of you know Black Lives Matter and getting caught up into this assumption of what it meant which really was is, is, is part of the status quo thinking and marginalization and internal racism. So 
thank you for addressing that, Dahlia. But what I also wanted to point out is that you are the movement. Every one of us, regardless of your phenotype, regardless of the ascribed forced racial category to which you were put into and the meanings behind that, but if you are engaging in, in whatever your internal struggles are to the betterment of even understanding what's going on, um, you are part of the movement. We're all part of the movement. The movement isn't just about the people who are standing out with signs or the movement of, of people who engage through so, so social media to try to rally people behind some saying. We are all the movement. And the movement is global. Because like I said, all of these things in the form of global white supremacy, and again, y'all, I don't want you to get caught up in this idea of skin as a representative of whiteness. And in most cases it is, but it's also the structure. So I go back to colorism, right? Um, but this is a, a movement that is now global. And I don't want us to forget that. And our individual experiences are not less than or greater than anybody else's. So if you don't take anything else from my words, I want, I really want it to be more of an empowerment. I know that I am not just opinionated on the things that I'm talking about. Um, you know, I'm, I'm able to make connections. That's a part of my gifts. Um, I'm able to make connections to make sense of things contextually. So I understand things on a, on a, on a, 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 a huge level that it's, it, I don't have enough time for me to try to even go into but I want wherever you are, wherever you are, even if it's still at a place of relative denial, take that, delve into it, explore it internally, like the brave people here on the panel who have shared where they were, really come to terms with it and don't be afraid to speak from that truth, but recognize when you are being defensive, because that's going to be the first step. And like I, and I, and I don't know about Facebook book and expletives, but like I tell my students, you know, we're human. We all have our shit. You have to recognize your shit before you have the audacity to go point out somebody else's. And then we have to deal with our own shit first. And if you happen to have people in solidarity who can, can help you wade through your shit, and specifically for people of whiteness or for people of color who are white adjacent in terms of their thinking, if you are brave enough and have somebody who's caring enough, who can see your shit and who can point it out to you lovingly or otherwise, and you are brave enough to hear it, lick your wounds, and then move forward, you are then part of the movement. So that's kind of what I want to leave you with at this moment. So. That is a beautiful moment. And I thank you. I thank you so much. And so we are running, you know, we are at the end of our time here. I'd like to give a little, uh, just a few mentions. One, first of all, a big thanks to Nancy Wyatt and to my parents, Ursi Potter and Carter Hearn for joining us today. Um, Nancy and Ursi are decades long activists, human rights activists, peace activists. Uh, they have been down in the trenches fighting for everyone's right to be recognized as a unique individual human being with full legal rights and abilities. And without question, I'd like to have a follow-up session with Nancy, Ursi, and Carter another time to uh, continue this conversation from the perspective with, you know, this brilliant history and experience. Um, and also we have had people commenting also about what about the indigenous Americans, you know? Yes, and we have here Rosemaria, Dr. Daryl, Gary and Uma, you know, who are indigenous American and Rosemaria who has professional experience, you know, of um, great knowledge. Rosemary, did you have anything wanted to yeah, share on this? I did, and thank, thank you for you. having this. It's been it's been very interesting, um, and I have to say that it, as an indigenous person, and and Black Lives Matter has brought to the forefront um, with that energy that we've all needed. That as indigenous people, we have never been able to 
to to gain that that energy that that black lives and and as indigenous people we realize that we need to step behind and we have stepped behind the black lives movement because we know that once we are able to come together we 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 can then have other indigenous lives asian lives all as one people but one thing my my point i wanted to um bring up was when we said systemic and and where does it begin and and the united states will not address this i've, I've heard that from many of my friends and they don't understand that it it started way way long ago um, and it's very systemic and it's something that is so embedded in the United States that we don't even realize. And that is a document that is called the, Dis the Doctrine of Discovery, which I've just posted it. Um, that is a document that Col Christopher Columbus used to come to the United States. That was a papal document in 1490, whatever what it was. Um, that Thomas Jefferson also used for, for his writings, which was a document allowing him to come to other countries and take over the land and its people. So this goes way back. So when we talk about having to understand um, and have discussions, you know, it, it goes back to, to the religious authority. And, and that is very hard for Americans, or, or at least my friends to understand, because when I start talking about it, they're like, well, that, that, we have nothing to do with that. That was something that happened way before us. And I'm thinking, no, it's something that is continuous. And until we address that, it, nothing will change. But my hope is, and, and, and my, I'm, I'm so happy to see the, the young people, younger than me, address this. And, and I think that's that's the, those people are are breaking the glass, so to speak. So mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. And you know, I just have to say, Gary, Nikki, I know you are hiding behind your avatar. If you're comfortable, I would really love for you to share what you said to me yesterday about using for white people to use ho'o pono pono to heal our relationship with these centuries of slavery. Hi, Benita, this is Gary Nicky. I'm not hiding behind the avatar. That's my tiger picture because I happen to have low bandwidth because of people streaming tons of video and the uh, audio and everything goes away. So I've learned after tons of Zoom calls, you just put on the tiger and everybody's happy. I'm actually three quarters Japanese and one quarter Mexican. So I grew up in Paradise Valley, Arizona. And uh, just a brief piece is, uh, it was, hey, Jap, remember Pearl Harbor? You know, and then four or five big cowboys would beat the crap out of me in the bathroom, kick me on the floor and pee on me. And so I grew up terrified. And then when I said, hey, I'm not just Japanese, I'm one quarter Mexican too. And then they're like, oh, you're a damn dirty wetback, but you look like a like a Jap, so we're going to kick your ass anyway. What's interesting is it uh, got me into being really angry and then learning some uh, family empty hand techniques to be able to fight and defend myself and then my other friends that were being picked on. So that got me really angry. And for the last 15 years, I've been doing anger management for the courts and stuff like that in the D.C. metro area. But I spent about 19 plus years with disaster management with Red Cross and FEMA and state emergency management. And the thing that I found is that we're all the same. You know, when it comes to people that are hurting, who've gone through disasters, who had losses and everything, we're the ones that are lucky this time as the responders. We're able to go and help us. One of the things that I found, and Dr. Hugh Lynn from Ho'oponopono, in the mid 2000s, I got to go to a number of the trainings and three of them with him. And the last one he did was actually where the FEMA Ops Center was and at. They search out, capture, vanquish, and subdue all Saracens and pagans whatsoever. Reduce their persons to perpetual slavery and convert them to his and their use and profit. 
Anyone know what I'm reading here? Oh, I don't know. What, what was that? I could, I know. Could you hear me, Benita? Yeah, I thought that was you sharing something no, for uh -uh. us to hear. No, oh, okay. some, came, some came over and took over. Uh, okay, well, anyway, we're back to you. <laughs> one one of the things that um, Dr. Hugh Lynn had talked about, he said that even though um, Joe Vitelli made the, I'm sorry, please forgive me, thank you, I love you, famous, he said, uh, just focus on the I love you, thank you, the thank you, I love you, because he said it's all in there. And he said, the thing to think about is, what is it in me that is causing that situation, whatever that situation is? What is it that is causing me? Um, what is it in me that is causing that war, that murderer, that rapist, that uh, regime, that um, government entity, that person? What is it in me? And then simply cleaning ourselves. And to me, that was so powerful because I had all kinds of judgments and thoughts and issues and everything. And it's like, you know what? What is it in me that is causing that hatred? What is it in me that is causing that uh, violence? What is it in me that is causing that? And as I started to practice the whole Ho'oponopono process, uh, which is an ancient Hawaiian cleaning pro process, it really, it really shifted me a lot because I was able to start looking at myself and saying, okay, what is it in Gary Nobuo Nikki that is causing these things? And then as I clean myself, a lot of things have changed. And so uh, even my, my book that's coming out, DIY Zen and the Art of Gentle Emotional Transformation, it's been 22 years in the making. And the book has shifted. I have shifted. A lot of things have shifted. And so my thing now is, even when I talk to the anger management participants, because they're from all races, colors, creeds, ages, socioeconomic, everything. And I tell them, I said, think about what is it in me and for us to work on ourselves and move forward. And like Don Miguel Ruiz, who is a really great teacher, he said, we're all a piece of love and a piece of light that come together. And let's be love and let's be light. And let's love our friends and our neighbors and our colleagues and be together. And so by doing the Ho'oponopono cleaning, the thank you, I love you, I love you, thank you, that has changed my life and changed the lives of thousands. So thank you, bless you, and I send all of you lots of love, blessing, and good energy. So thank you very much, Benita. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And we've definitely run way over time, but like how wonderful, we have so much to share. And I know that um, I, I see like, I don't know if anyone has any final thing that you just gotta get out before we say goodbye. But, um, and if you have anything that you just wanna pour your heart out, we can do more of these, you know, whatever. I'd you like to add something. Um, Dahlia, your presentation made me want to know you much better because you did something that almost never happens in these conversations. Uh, racism is like peeling an onion and it is so insidious that it even affects those people who are being discriminated against in terms of being judged on the basis of are you high yellow, are you blue, black, blah, blah. And same thing with white folks. But even, I have very little patience with white people who are finding this all surprising because it's been going on since ever. But I would like to go with something Will said. People don't have to understand it in any depth to be able to take some constructive actions. For example, it's against the law to discriminate against people on the basis of race, religion, and whatever, whatever. And yet that happens all the time. So when you as an employee are in a company, you can challenge that in your own hiring processes. Uh, you can join volunteer groups that are actually helping people. For example, just to use myself, when we went into Sing Sing Prison with lifers, we went there to teach the residents how to do computers, how to use computers so that they had a way to earn money when they got out. They had a way to send money to the people whom they'd harmed, and they had a way to send money to their own families. 
So there are a lot of things you can do on a practical basis while you are trying to get educated about these various layers of that onion. So that's my sermon on the Mount for now. Thanks to all of you who had such good stuff to say. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you. And Tiffany, I know you have something you need to share with us. I just wanted to thank you for the forum. Thank you for having this conversation. Um, and I'd like to thank everyone who spoke. I've learned so much from each and every one of you. And um, I feel a sense of like um, camaraderie that, you know, this work is really important and that we're all, you know, in it together. Absolutely. Well, thank you all so much and thank everyone who joined us and watched us. And if you have any questions, feel welcome to keep them coming because that's how we grow the conversation. All right. Uh, goodbye, everyone on social media. And